This time at RGSL Chat Chamber, Christopher and I are welcoming Francesco Luigi Gatta. He is a visiting lecturer at RGSL and his specialty is EU law. More specifically, human rights, asylum seekers and immigration. So these are the topics we're going to talk about the most. He holds a double PhD in EU law. He is a research fellow at the University of Louvain, as well as has had many experiences in the European level, which he is happy to share. Congratulations, this is the second episode. We are very, very pleased to welcome Francesco Luigi Gatta, uh, who is a visiting lecturer at RGSL. Uh, today, uh, me, Christopher, and Marta will host. Hi. Yes, hi. And uh, yeah, so we are very, very pleased that you're here. And perhaps you would like to say some kind of uh, welcoming words. Yeah, thank you very much um, for, for having me and for the invitation. Um, I really like this um, this initiative that you're you're having, and I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it and to be uh, the second guest, if if I understand correctly. And so, I'm happy to to give you my my insights about whatever you would like to to, to know. Yeah, I think you will be a very important guest because you have this uh, you have this very European experience and. Uh, and I think from, from our peer perspective, this might be very useful, mm -hmm. both knowledge-wise and your experience-wise. Mm -hmm. So we have the questions that personally interest us and probably will interest also the peers. Yep. Okay. So let's start. Yeah, we can start. Um, so first, the question will be a bit provocative, based sure. on a quote. Um, so you probably know, of course, Margaret Thatcher, mm -hmm. and she has said about the European Union, yeah. And that the European Union is now based on a common language, culture and values. Mm -hmm. It is a result of plans. It is in fact a classic utopian project, a monument of vanity of intellectuals, a program whose inevitable destiny is a failure. Only the scale of the final damage done is in doubt. What do you think about this? Okay, um, that's pretty... Um, okay. <laughs> um, well, I... I Personally, I couldn't uh, disagree more with, with Mrs. Thatcher. Um, I would um, I would rather stick to um, another another British um, politician, which is who who, who is Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. And um, so let me like counter quote and or counter cite another. Um, another very important uh, politician and, and big personality who was Winston Churchill. Um, um, he, uh, he talked about the United States of Europe uh, right before the Second World War uh, in 1946. Uh, he gave this very important speech uh, at the University of Zurich mm -hmm. and this is actually how I start the course in European Union law. Every yeah, time I, I remember. Uh, yeah, every time I, I start, I begin a new a new course in European Union law, uh, and of course I started by I start by saying what when the European Union was created, why, how. I usually start with this with this uh, sentence by Winston Churchill, who strongly believed in the Euro in the United States of Europe. So, if we uh, he imagine. Uh, two brothers, the, the, the United States of America and the United States of Europe, uh, shaking hands over the ocean. And so he strongly believed in this, in the European integration process, in peace, in integration. So I would rather uh, stick to, to Churchill's uh, sentence and, and opinion rather than, uh, rather than uh, Margaret Thatcher. Although, although uh, what um, the sentence from, from, from Margaret Thatcher that you mentioned is, I mean, is still here nowadays because uh, the UK is, uh, is no longer a member of the Union and is about to leave the Union. So I believe that currently many citizens, many British citizens share this, this view, uh, but I don't. Uh, so uh, this is why they're moving out uh, from, from the Union. Um, but no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I'm, I'm, I disagree with. I respectfully disagree <laughs> yeah. with, with this. Uh, yeah. I mean that that was uh, the question before the following question about Brexit, mm -hmm. because you know the situation currently for for the last four years has been yes. very you know dramatic. We don't know what's going to happen. Unpredictable. Absolutely. Unpredictable. Yes. So. The following question is, what do you think about Brexit? How, what, what does it tell us about Europe's future? Mm -hmm. uh, is it 
is it gonna fail uh, the whole European Union or, or does it gonna show that actually European Union is stronger and mm -hmm. uh, it's fine that they're leaving even though it's the first time so our country leaves okay. you. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, the whole Brexit situation is very complicated. Um, so people in London, they don't know how to deal with it. People in Brussels, they don't know how to deal with it. So me neither. I am not uh, uh, the person to to uh, to solve all the issues. This, this can also be seen how how long the negotiations. Yes, are exactly. Um, well, as you as you correctly pointed out, this is the first time in the history of the European Union integration process that the state decided to to leave the union. Um, you can do that under European Union law. You can you you know nobody forces you to to be in the union. You can request to be a member, to become a member state, and you can ask to leave. Exactly. That's that's up to you. You can do that. Um, British people voted so. That's democracy, that's one of the fundamental values and principles of the European Union, so we, we have to respect it. We can, um, we can maybe uh, not agree with that. I have many um, friends from, 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 from London, from the UK. They are really, um, really uh, devastated by this, by this decision, but that's the people. People voted in favor of leaving the Union, so that's a democratic decision that was a referendum. And we have, I think, to respect this decision. However, this took place in 2016, as you know, and four years later, um, four year, four years later, we are still trying to figure out how the U UK can actually leave the union. So, this may suggest the idea that you cannot really leave the European Union. It's very common. Even if you can, on paper, formally, legally and formally speaking, because that's European Union law, that's the treaty, and they are now negotiating an international treaty, um, laying down, you know, the provisions uh, to in order to govern the future relationship between the UK and the Union, and the UK will no longer be a member state of the Union, formally. However, it will still be bound to European Union law, legislation, and I would say also legal tradition and all the case law mm -hmm. developed by the Court of Justice of the European Union or all the legal relationships, legal dynamics that have been developed during these decades because the UK joined the Union in the mm -hmm. 70s. So it's almost 40 years of membership. And that will be, that will have a really lasting consequence. Yes, still. I believe yeah. so, absolutely. You can't just, you know, erase, delete yeah, 40, the case law. 40 years, uh, four decades of, of, of legislation, of uh, collaboration, of um, experience, participation in the European integration process like this. So uh, they want out, they, were, they are going out, they will be formally out of the European Union, but I believe that um, this whole Brexit thing shows us that it is really difficult to 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 get away from the Union, uh, really. Yeah, and still they are still debating that. Uh, they are fighting again, um, again uh, about this this uh, Brexit. Uh, but question the question is still there on the table. They haven't solved it yet. So this shows, I think, how you know uh, ties are really really intense and close with the union yeah. Yeah. that's perhaps some some good good thing about uh, some people who perhaps refused the, the withdrawal so they still know that there will be mm -hmm. this kind of a connection yeah. with eu yeah but yeah uh perhaps we can um, we can now shake some things up you know mm -hmm. we know that uh, you have been uh, you know focusing on migration issues uh, yes. recently and I think this is a very important thing, uh, especially recently knowing that the uh, Commission is, uh, you know, uh, Commission has just uh, created the new Migration Pact, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, yeah. and then, you know, and there are many kind of problems, uh, has yes. been already since 2014. Uh, yeah. 
perhaps for our listeners that would be very interesting to know, but the refugee is a person who has fled their own country because they are at risk of serious human rights violations and persecution there. Mm -hmm. An asylum seeker is a person who has left their country and is seeking protection from persecution and serious human rights violations in another country, but who hasn't yet legally recognized as a, yes. been legally recognized as a refugee and is waiting to receive decision on the asylum claim. And some migrants leave their country because they want to work, study or join a family, for example. Uh, but there is no specific definition. So migrant is this kind of a biggest term. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the for our listeners and for our curiosity, well, what do you what do you how do you see the new migration pack, pack perhaps? You know, it is still unclear for many, but could you please explain how specifically is the EU's common asylum system abused? and what would change regarding this issue and similar ones under the Commission's new Migration Pact? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, sure. Um, migration is, 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 a, is a huge issue. Uh, I would say it's uh, actually a sort of constitutional issue uh, in Europe nowadays. Um, it is something that has, um, that has to do with Brexit, uh, that we just mentioned that, but um, this was one of the main uh, arguments for um, Brexiters, right? Migration. We want to control our borders. We want to be in full command of protection of our national territory and decide who uh, is allowed to enter and who uh, must stay uh, stay out. Uh, you mentioned that then migration had um, a huge repercussions on huge repercussions on Europe in 2014 and 15. That was the big refugee crisis or migration crisis, how it was called. Which also impacted Brexit. Which also yeah. impacted our Brexit, absolutely. And it is still uh, an issue today. Um, the new pact, the new migration and asylum pact, as it is called, um, it, was, uh, it is a long-awaited uh, reform or attempt to, to reform the system. It is still uh, a proposal by, by uh, the European Commission. So the von der Leyen Commission has put on the table what is a reform package. Uh, so it's a set of different proposals, uh, regulations and directives that will have to be yeah you know, debated and, and discussed uh, between the two legislators, uh, the, the Council and the European Parliament. So we, we can expect, I would say, maybe years of negotiations before... before. Years. It depends. It depends on the political will of, um, of, of the two legislators. Um, European Parliament represents the citizens. Yeah. Uh, it's the theoretically the most democratic institution of the Union and it usually has an approach towards migration that is uh, let's say a more human rights oriented approach so uh, more humanitarian approach uh, which uh, try to take into consideration uh, the, the lives the and well -being the, the, the well-being yeah. of migrants and so on while the Council is of course the institutions that represent states and states are um, highly concerned about the protection of their borders, internal security. Especially, especially I think, Visegrad group countries. Absolutely, the Visegrad countries. Also, you know, for electoral purposes, yeah. because uh, migration is always, is always there when it comes to new elections, and there are many populist movements that really push a lot, um, you know, uh, regarding, regarding migration. So it's really uh, too early now to, uh, to express uh, a judgment uh, or an opinion on the new pact, but there are already opinions that are expressing criticism regarding this pact because it's not really that ambitious and it is likely that it won't probably change much. So although it is called a new pact, also, though, I think the terminology chosen by the Commission is quite evocative, new mm -hmm. pact. So it should be something new, it should be really a reform that changes the previous system, the so-called Dublin system, which is not working at all. So the idea is to have something completely new, different, a fresh start on migration. This is a, a quote from the von der Leyen, President von der Leyen, when she um, um, 
yeah, when she went and became in charge of the commission, uh, she, she mentioned we need a fresh start on migration. I'm not entirely sure this will be a fresh start uh, because there will be still issues in terms of solidarity, so fair, um, you know, responsibility sharing between between the countries. I think the, the solidarity is a very good word here because yes. there is, has been proposed this kind of a new obligatory so yes. solidarity principle. You either pay for repatriation of these uh, of of people or or building of these uh, centers, as I understand, mm -hmm. or you take uh, some some of the this kind of a proportion of people yes. in. Yes, exactly. Uh, one, yeah, one of the uh, one of the ideas of this new pact is to uh, try to concretely implement the principle of solidarity. So, the, the basic idea is this is not only a problem, a matter for Italy, Greece, yeah. Spain, or Malta, but everyone has to play its role, mm -hmm. and even countries that are geographically far away from the Mediterranean. Let's, uh, for example, let's say. Uh, Latvia, for yeah. example, you have to take a certain amount of uh, of asylum seekers or, or migrants. Mm -hmm. There, there will be uh, some specific distribution keys in order to establish uh, these, these different quotas, and you know this would be, ideally, this would be an obligation yeah. under European Union law. You you cannot, um, you have to to give your contribution, but. Um, there was already an attempt to do that in, the, in, in 2015 with the relocation mechanism, it was called, Similar. and it gave birth to a big political legal fight uh, between the European Union and the Visegrad countries, not only the Visegrad countries, but especially the Visegrad countries, and um, so this is quite a strong precedent, and I'm not entirely sure this new mechanism will, will work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. I think I think that this will this will be a good uh, kind of an introduction for people who mm -hmm. uh, from 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 the community of RGSL. If they are more interested, they can probably listen and read. But uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the next question is more uh, addressed to uh, current issues regarding refugees and and, and asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. And one of the recent ones was around a month ago in Greece when there was. Um, on the island of Lesbos, there was a terrible situation of living conditions for around 8,000 uh, refugees mm -hmm. because there was a fire yes. and then they, the, there was an emergency situation. And I wanted to ask, I, I read that UN uh, refugee agency is working on this issue, but what does, what, what role plays the EU in such a situation? Uh, how they address it, how they help? Like, what, is there mm -hmm. a special role for EU okay. in that uh, situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's that's um. That's, okay. That's a good question. It's a it's a complex question. Um, I believe you are referring to uh, uh, this very big fire that uh, broke out in the Moria camp mm -hmm. in um, the uh, yeah one of the Greek islands. Um, when it comes to uh, solidarity, support, um, help uh, in favor of member states. Um, the European Union has different ways of providing help of supporting countries. Um, there might be a sort of financial solidarity, economic solidarity, which basically means money, uh, economic resources, economic funds that are un unblocked in basically in Brussels. They, they decided that they will, uh, you know, give Greece a certain amount of uh, of euros of money, so that they will use it. They they will use this money to I don't know uh, to to build a new uh, new infrastructures, new facilities, or they will use to uh, I don't know to hire more um, more people working there in these in these refugees camps and so on. So that's the first way um, in which the European Union can help can support countries. Uh, that's so-called financial or economic solidarity. Another way, um, another possible solution is uh, so-called uh, operational solidarity, uh, practical solidarity, meaning that the European Union will deploy people, people mm -hmm. or equipment okay. or technical or personal equipment uh, to Greece, to Italy, to Spain, 
so that they will support local authorities, national Greek authorities or Italian authorities uh, operating uh, at the borders. Um, the European Union in particular has two agencies that are in charge of that. One of uh, these agencies is, uh, is known as Frontex. Yes. This is the, Euro the name is European Border and Coast Guard Agency. It's, it's better known as Frontex. This is an agency operating for the security and control of borders. So the European Union may decide to activate, to trigger this agency and the support mechanism of this agency deploying, let's say, helicopters or vessels or border guards that will be sent to Greece and will have Greek authority to deal with migratory pressure. Another agency is called EASO, that's the European Asylum Support Office. So it's, again, a body of the European Union in charge of dealing with asylum-related yes. issues. They will decide to deploy uh, liaison officers or personnel to Lesbos or to another Greek island. And by the way, coming back uh, just quickly to the new pact uh, uh, put forward by the von der Leyen Commission, one of the issues uh, on the table is the reinforcement of this asylum office. This EASO, this EASO it will be, theoretically, will be reinforced, will be enhanced and turned into a new European asylum agency, mm -hmm. which theoretically will have much more power, much more competencies, Funding fundings, personnel, mm -hmm. and will be a fully operational, theoretically, a fully operational agency mm -hmm. um, which will be able to support Greece, Italy, Malta, and so on. So that's another way um, in which, by which the European Union can support member states. Or finally, another form of solidarity would be a personal solidarity or humanitarian solidarity, which would mean taking people from Greece and moving them away and distribute these people to other member countries. This is what we, we were discussing yeah. before, this relocation mechanism, this quota mechanism. So, you know, relieving the pressure on Italy, on Greece, by moving, basically, by, by putting people on a plane and moving them to, to Latvia, to Poland, to Luxembourg, so as to, you know, mm -hmm. a little, not to solve the issue of the migratory pressure, but at least to, to help, to support a little bit the, 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 the frontline countries. So I would say these are the, the three types, the three possibilities of, of support, economic, financial, solidarity, operational, practical solidarity or humanitarian, personal solidarity. What do you think, which of them is the most efficient and like uh, plausible way? Okay, um, the most, um, I'm not sure that's the most efficient, but for sure that's the easiest. Yeah. It's money. It's just, it's just money, the yeah. economic, uh, financial form of support mm -hmm. because, you know, they will decide that in Brussels, they will approve uh, this kind of measure and money basically will be uh, given to Greece or mm -hmm. to Italy. That's easy to, that to is, do, that's yeah. easy to decide, that's easy to do. Less responsibility also. Yeah, you, yeah. Can, do it, you can do that immediately mm -hmm. um, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, the operational or practical support also is, if it is you know well done, well performed, is is also important because you can do something really on the ground, practically, concretely. So you will give uh, Greek authorities practical support, uh, deploying people, technical equipment, vessels, and so on. So that's pretty much uh, useful if it is done in a timely manner, in an efficient manner. The most complicated form of solidarity, of support, is definitely the personal form of solidarity, the, the, the humanitarian form of solidarity, meaning moving people, redistributing, relocating people around Europe. Why? Because certain member states are not willing to receive yeah. these, As we already, these, yeah. these people. Uh, we mentioned the Visegrad group especially, 
um, and you know they are invoking their sovereign right to decide who can enter their territory mm -hmm. and and that's it they they are not willing to accept this form of solidarity they might be willing to support frontline states by giving money okay fine I will contribute e economically you know yeah. but I'm not letting these people inside my country, inside my territory. I'm not ready to do that. I, I'm not willing to do that. I can contribute, again, money, that's easy to do. You need just a decision. You, you write a certain amount of money, you write a check, you give it to Greece. Greece, well, you, you, you do what you need to do with this money, that's it. But I'm not taking people in, I'm, and so on. Also, you know, for, for uh, um, for electoral purposes also, for in terms of uh, governments do not want to, uh, there is this, uh, you know, this image of, of letting these foreigners in this immigration, what, what we have been discussing yeah. so far, is always a very highly politicized issue. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, it also, like, I had to ask uh, how COVID, COVID definitely has mm -hmm. an impact on this uh, whole mm -hmm. situation as well. Yes. Because if we look at, you know, this personal type of uh, distribution, mm -hmm. again, the question is, what if there is a COVID case and mm -hmm. now we're going to spread them all over the world yes. in all EU countries, right? Absolutely. Well, COVID-19 uh, COVID is another big crisis, another big issue that the European Union is facing or is trying to face. And COVID has, of course, a big impact on, on migration, on asylum, on, on asylum seekers. Um, first of all, because it may uh, paralyze all these kind of transfers of, of, movement, of movements between countries, um, but also in terms of um, protection of people, of migrants themselves. Um, like, like here, right now, in Latvia or in other countries, we are observing all these, you know, restrictions and, and preventive measures like social distancing, one meter, two meters, whatever. In the migration, in the migrants camps in Greece, you can't just, you cannot simply do that. Yeah. So observing the most simple, basic, uh, anti-COVID role, which is social distancing, which is keeping one meter, two meters of distance, is simply impossible. Mm -hmm. Because there is such a severe overcrowding there in these camps uh, that are so overloaded, uh, really um, way above the capacity of these infrastructures, that migrants are there, you know, there is no way that you can keep one meter yeah. of distance between them. So what about the protection uh, in these situations? What about uh, the, the, the contagion, the pace of the contagion um, of COVID in these kind of situations? Um, another um, debated issue which connects migration and COVID is, for example, what about people that arrive to yeah. Europe? What about new incoming migrants? Mm -hmm. um, this is happening right now in Italy and there is a debate, it, uh, this is a controversy because these people uh, usually they are kept um, on board vessels, they are called quarantine ships or quarantine vessels. So they are kept there because, for weeks, you know, for, for two weeks or whatever and they do not let them disembark mm -hmm. because they might be, you know, in they fact, might they have are. COVID, yeah. you have to check them. But then you keep them on board, there is no social distancing there, so there are issues also in terms of, um, yeah. Some human rights infringements. Some, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Okay, uh, I had perhaps, uh, let's step back. Uh -huh. uh, how did you, or when did you, develop your interest in, in European law, in European Union law, or mm -hmm. international law? Was there some kind of a, a uh, small Francesco who okay. understood at one moment yeah. that this is your this is your thing. Uh huh. Okay. Um, yeah, I think if yeah if I have to uh, sort of yeah identify a specific moment uh, in my life, um, I would probably say that this was my Erasmus mm -hmm. um, when I when I did uh, my Erasmus uh, in that was in Germany. 
um, that was in um, during my third year of, of university. I studied law in yeah. Italy, which um, which takes five years normally. I mean, if you are good enough and quick enough to 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 conclude, that's five within five years. And um, yeah, so I was right in the middle of my. Um, university um, career, let's say the third year, and I decided to, to do the Erasmus um, yeah. program. Um, I chose Germany because I wanted to learn uh, and consolidate a new, a new language other than English. Yeah. And so I went there initially for one semester, uh, then I realized, oh, that's too cool, I want another semester. And I stayed there for a whole year. So oh, I spent, that was possible. Yes, yes. Oh. I spent two semesters uh, in Germany, so a whole year uh, there. And um, yeah, I believe that was like the the sort of turning point in my in my mind that um, you know triggered this 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 passion I had for European Union for. Um, the European integration process and and all of that because I had the chance to you know to live abroad uh, to 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 live in a in an international environment multicultural environment speak another language meet uh, friends and yeah. people from all all, all, all over Europe, around yeah. Europe uh, I, I still had friends and I and I talk with them. Uh, on a regular basis, from from Spain, from Poland, from Germany, from the UK, uh, everybody was there. We were having so much fun. We were playing football together. We used to mix mix up teams. So yeah. um, and uh, we hang out together. So it was absolutely a beautiful a beautiful period. Also, I had the chance to, of course, to to study uh, European Union law. And to you know to attend lectures uh, in German or in English, so this whole experience was really um, was absolutely um, fundamental for me in developing this um, this passion and this faith, I would say, that I have in the European Union and in the European integration process. So that was probably the moment, my my Erasmus. Yeah. So you would suggest using this opportunity for any student. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, if uh, yeah, absolutely. That there should be there should be an obligation, to, <laughs> obligation. To, to, to go abroad and to do uh, an Erasmus at, at some point. Uh, yeah, if I'll be one day, I don't know, the Ministry of uh, or the Commissioner or or something for, for education for yeah. education, I, I will try to pass this reform. Oh, yeah. Shall be mandatory. <laughs> I, I, I would be your. I would be your most passionate supporter. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Chris, first and I, before the interview, we talked about that you have had two trainer traineeships yes. uh, in uh, European Union institutions. Yes, exactly. Um, we are actually personally interested, and uh -huh. I think many other uh, students as well. Yes. How how was your experience? Okay. You were in legal service, and you were in human rights committee and legal affairs. Yes, right. Yes. So how was your experience? It was it was great. It was absolutely great. That was another um, like important uh, pivotal moment in my in my career. I I would say. Um, I did two trainships. Uh, the first one I did it um, at, in Strasbourg at the Council of Europe, which is not the European oh, Union. Okay. It's another international organization dealing with human rights, um, and that was that was amazing. Really, uh, it was uh, really an important experience that um, opened my mind. Really. Um, towards human rights protections and human rights issues and um, you know um, strongly strongly convinced me about the importance of, of, of human rights protection and talking about human rights and try to do something about that the second trainship was in Brussels uh, in the European Parliament in the legal service of the European Parliament and that was also uh, a great experience because it gave me the opportunity to concretely touch, so to say, the institutions. Mm -hmm. I had been studying the institutions, you know, in the books, 
So I used to study, okay, this is how the European Parliament works, and yeah. then there is Article 1 and Article 2, and then there is all this blah blah, which is beautiful. I, I liked it and I loved that so much. But doing the trainship was living this, was concretely experiencing all these added value also. Absolutely. Yeah. It was it was switching from a book, mm. from theory to reality, yeah. to how concretely uh, the, the machinery of the European Union works in Brussels, really right in the heart of the European Union. So these training ships, they might be also said that they were another kind of Erasmus program. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. So yeah, I think... Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 I would say, I would say so. Um, um, yeah, you, I mean, you have fun, but you, have, you still have to, I mean, you have to yeah, work while, while you are there. So it, and it's a paid, maybe, yeah, it's, it's, a, paid, it's, it's uh, a paid internship, yeah. it's a paid trainship, so maybe there was uh, a little bit less room for, you know, for partying and mm -hmm. for, for this kind of, for drinking and partying, but, um, but yeah, somehow it was a sort of, uh, Erasmus uh, 2.0, I would yeah, say. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Have Have there been some people that also somehow helped you to 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 choose uh, your some kind of a competence, or perhaps just uh, inspired you, or or mentored you even, or, on how to do some things, mm -hmm. or please apply to this and please read that. This will be very important for you. Okay. Perhaps there's something also that that not directly for you, but for many has been a very helpful kind of a pe per person or a source that you might suggest? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, well, um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't really have a um, sort of, of mentor yeah. um, when, I, when I wrote my, my degree thesis or even my PhD thesis. Um, I mean, my supervisor back then uh, left me uh, really uh, a lot of freedom mm -hmm. to to decide what to do, um, where to go. Which, on the one hand, is good because you you know you can really uh, do a lot of stuff. On the other hand, it may be not that good insofar as you find yourself in you know swimming in the ocean, and you know you have to to choose where to go. Um, so what, where I really obtained uh, directions or orientations was mainly um, by talking with, with people, with, with friends of mine, with colleagues, um, um, really in an informal way or, or looking for information by myself on the internet um, about, about trainships, uh, going into uh, the official websites of the institution, um, you, really, you really have to be really active and proactive in trying to find this kind of information. Um, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't really have any specific uh, guidance, I would say. So this is the first filter in a sense, that people who are not active yeah. do not uh, get these kind of options. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have to, yeah, yeah, I would say that, sure. Um, I mean, if you're lucky enough to, um, to encounter a professor or a person or a researcher on your way that has been doing that and can give you suggestions, can give you guidance, that's, You're very lucky, that's, I would say. <laughs> that's good for you, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, what, I, what I've been doing so far, I kind of uh, found, that, uh, found that out by myself, basically. And once I was living in, in Brussels, in Strasbourg, uh, in Belgium and so on, I, um, once again, I engaged in, in conversations with people. I, I nurtured myself um, from the experiences yeah. of, of, other, of other persons. Uh, because then I have, I have friends and I have colleagues that, uh, for example, decided to, to remain there in Brussels. And today they, they work for the institutions. Uh, other people like myself decided to go into like more into parents. academia. Yeah. Um, I have other friends uh, who works as lawyers, for example. And you, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm still in contact with these people on a regular basis, and we confront, we confront with each other, we discuss, 
and we we describe our own experiences. Good network. Yeah, we network, and that's a way of of also getting information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, also reliable information because if I directly know a person and this is a friend of mine, I know that uh, his or her information might be uh, of use. Of, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did you get involved with RGSL specifically? Because previously you had more experience in Central Europe, and mm -hmm. now uh, how how that happened? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> yes. Um, well, I um, I have always been um, moving around, sort of vagabonding around mm -hmm. in, in Europe, uh, enjoying my my freedom of movement as as a citizen. <laughs> um, yeah, and. Um, it's not unintentional that I that I like migration and I study uh, you know I, res I do research in, in migration um, because I I, I, I I usually make this joke I'm a migrant myself yeah. moving around moving around in Europe and different countries um, the whole the whole thing about RGSL um, is 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 the following some someone I don't even remember who a colleague of, or a colleague of mine in, in Belgium at the university, um, sent me an email, forwarded me an email um, with a, with a vacancy yeah. here at RGSL for for as a visiting professor uh, for teaching um, European Union law, and uh, so I just received an email from a f again networking yeah, that, uh, among yeah. among friends and among colleagues among so um, this person sent me an email. Uh, saying, look, there is this vacancy. I know that you are, you know, pursuing your sort of academic career. So why not? Mm -hmm. You can you can try and apply uh, because I saw this vacancy and I, this vacancy and I'm forwarding it to you. So what I did was applying for this uh, for this position, and um, and that's it. That's it. This is then I was I was I was selected, and. Um, uh, and I was I was a little I was really happy but a little surprised really uh, let me let me check where Latvia is on the map <laughs> let, let me let me open Google Map to, to check where I'm going um, I knew that of course but you know still you know <laughs> still, to be sure <laughs> yeah it, 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 it's up there somewhere yeah, yeah, yeah there should be the Baltic Sea there but let me just check and um and that was it and i was lucky enough to 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 come here because before the whole covid um situation broke out uh, really really seriously um yeah because as you might know um italy my country was one of the most affected countries in terms of contagion and um yeah but i managed to 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 come here and uh, I was lucky enough to, to, to be to be here. Yeah. Knowing your academic career, which is I think interesting because you have so many articles, you know, uh, out in the internet. Um, mm -hmm. Do you believe that you either publish or perish, or, or do you somehow approach this uh, uh, this topic somehow differently? That this kind of a, a feeling that you either need to somehow all the time write something and, and, and you know share it to the mm -hmm. world or either you somehow do not uh, become a good academic or, or how do you see that? Um, of course uh, well publishing is a very important uh, thing yeah. if you if you are in academia um, because uh, first of all is uh, it is essential for you I think because it's a way of of getting information and a way of being updated yeah. about what, what is going on. Um, so this is crucial uh, in terms of, for example, of, of new laws, so new legislation that is passed, that has been adopted. Um, so let's take again this example of this new pact of uh, migration and asylum uh, proposed by the von der Leyen Commission. You need to study it, you need to read it, you need to analyze it, to examine it. Um, if you want to express criticism about it, fine, you can do that. Uh, but you need to study it, and you know, to it's not that you have to publish something about that. But if you want to share your ideas, your opinions about something, you should, you you can do that by writing an article mm -hmm. or by participating in a conference, in a seminar. So it's it's both a way. Uh, for yourself to be updated yeah. about something and a way 
of making yourself known. Yeah. You know, to so it's like your homework. You you, yeah. you show that you have done the homework. Yes, right? yes, yes, basically, and um, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. I I had one important, I think, interesting question. Uh, you know, personally also. Perhaps, what has been the most significant opinion, idea, or principle on which you have changed your stance completely in the last uh, year or two? Mm -hmm. uh, and what caused your opinion to change so that drastically? Okay. Um, remar regarding uh, European Union uh, or what I'm... Yeah. I would say ju just generally. That may be European Union, that may be something personal, some kind of attitude towards life or, or some kind of a value. But Okay, um, maybe um, wh what I, w yeah, what it changed was that at the beginning I was um, totally uh, faithfully devoted to the European Union and to the idea of the European Union, mm -hmm. so don't touch it, that's the European Union, I love it, it's perfect, it's wonderful, I, I love it, don't, okay, I, I love it. Um, but yeah, maybe uh, step by step, by uh, by studying, by researching, by publishing, by writing other stuff, I probably um, switch uh, to a more uh, to a different approach, which is I should, we should also criticize the European Union. The European Union is not perfect to make at it all. better. Yeah. To make it better, absolutely. Um, it is a it is an ongoing process, it's a work in, in progress, right? So the European Union is evolving and has many positive sides, many positive aspects, but also aspects and elements that do not work, that do not work at all. So by publishing, by writing articles or writing on a blog or publishing in a journal, I should also, you know, be uh, honest with myself and express criticism is if I believe that uh, there is room for criticism regarding the European Union and what the European Union is doing or, or not doing. So yeah, I would mention this kind of change of approach approach uh, yeah, that I have to, towards the Union. Yeah. I think it sounds very reasonable and noble yeah. for, for the development of the union and, and, and the quality yeah. of its legislature yeah. okay and now to sum up maybe you have a question to us maybe you want to say something or yeah. some, some some comment to our yeah. listeners also okay um yeah my question to you will be um how how do you feel about the european union uh, and what is uh, what is going on in Brussels? What is in Brussels? Is something that attracts you? Is something that is that scares you? Um, from my perspective, I'm and one of the reasons why also I decided to 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 come here to Riga and to Latvia is that uh, well, Latvia is a relatively uh, young country, young member state of the European Union. Um, that's really fascinating for me because my country, Italy, was one of the founding members of the European Union. Uh, so it was there since the beginning. And it is quite sad to see that, however, Italy is now one of the countries in which the Euroscepticism, the Eurocriticism, is at, a, at its highest level. So I'm really interested about, about Latvia, about sort of the feeling about European Union and about what is going on in, in, in Brussels, so to say, especially from, from you as, as, a young, as a young student. Uh, you, you can, you can uh, say. Okay, um, for me personally, um, if you look at the history, it was very, very important for us to join EU because we joined NATO, we joined all the international, uh, regional or uh, non-governmental organizations at that time because it provided us as a small young country security. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, we are still in the neighbors with Russia mm -hmm. and this made us closer to EU, to the West. And um, I feel like it was, it was important then and we are happy that it provided us the security and we are still thankful for that 
that we uh, we get there, we got there, and we are still a part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we are evolving in that way faster and getting closer to all of uh, the developed uh, EU countries. I would, I would, I would, uh, I think I would completely agree uh, with Marta on a personal level. But uh, you know, if we look at uh, like a national level, I see that there is also Euro skepticism. I think that's a that's a I would say a phenomenon uh, in each country, right? Yes. Uh, perhaps it's not that uh, well articulated in in Latvia, but it is there. There are countries that criticize. Uh, there are uh, not countries. Sorry, there are parties that criticize. Uh, uh, many aspects of the European Union. Uh, mm -hmm. There are uh, also po populist parties, and, and and there are. I would say still there is this kind of a resentment in in some parts of the population, and and really no, I'm talking here about circles, right? Because there is a circle of people who are very pro EU, and there are people who sure. who feel that they have not achieved the aims that. Uh, they thought would be possible when joining the EU mm -hmm. in a sense that they don't see as much this economic uh, kind of uh, perhaps development as they thought sh there should be or and, and they feel that this is just some kind of a uh, you know nothing much really for for my daily kind of a uh, life mm -hmm. and, and then I, mm -hmm. I, I of course I see that some of these aspects might be true that there has been some some things that have not been addressed most uh, most certainly and some of these aspects have been really the case that the people have not gotten the information really mm -hmm. about sure. how much really uh, EU has had some impact uh, just I don't know probably the the, the device uh, our listeners is listening from this podcast uh, will have dozens of, of EU directives and regulations about yeah, it sure. that uh, make it even possible now to to do this. And but yeah, I would I, I personally am I'm quite optimistic about the EU. I I, I see that it uh, constantly is going through some kind of a metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. You know, some some internal disputes, some developments. Really, I think yeah. this is the the beauty of the democratic process. Sure. And, but I'm quite optimistic. Yeah, and I dare to say that um, many, especially the older generations, they don't know the impact EU has uh, had sure. in the last 16 yeah. years on our, our country's legislation. But that's, I think like that's that. an interesting uh, it, phenomenon. I don't know, of course, if Italy uh, has the same, but but it may be for the fact that that older generations, on on average, are more apolitical mm -hmm. because of the like the USSR Soviet Union past, okay. right? Mm -hmm. so so it was not something that you get involved in. If you got involved in politics or mm -hmm. some kind of higher affairs, that was not a good indication. You just lived your life and you just wanted yeah. to brush it off and somewhere under the carpet. Yeah. So this, I think, this narrative somehow is still evident. Yeah, sure. Also, I believe that if you, um, by making a comparison with older generations, yeah you can really measure how lucky we are, I would say, today, and which kind of freedoms and rights we enjoy currently in the European Union. Um, so, just to make an example and speaking about myself, I was able to, to come here to Riga, to Latvia, quite easily, you know, on a plane, um, taking quite a cheap flight yeah. because all of the competition rules and competition dynamics that are going on in Europe yeah. so this helped to keep prices you know competitive and uh, quite you know affordable um, so I was I was able to get on a plane come here to Latvia in a couple of hours uh, only with my ID with my yeah, national identity that's card uh, I, I as soon as uh, the plane landed in Riga you know, I switched my Wi phone on and I was just immediately able to use all my services in, on my Wi phone, all my apps, uh, using the tariffs that I have with my operator in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to, to, to go in the internet looking for, um, you know, information and whatever I needed. Uh, I was immediately able to, to buy stuff with the same currency I had in my country with the same euros that I had in my pockets, I was immediately able to do transactions, to buy, to buy something. I was able to communicate with people in a country I was never been to, 
using English, yeah. which is normally um, usually spoken everywhere. Um, I was able to work here in Latvia, to reside here in Latvia, to teach in Latvia. And this is pretty amazing if you think about that. Uh, so if I think about my grandparents, but even my parents, none of that was possible. Or at least it was very, very, very yeah, difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. So by comparing my situation with that of my uh, with that of older generations i believe i can really measure how lucky i am how lucky i consider myself in enjoying all these freedoms fundamental freedoms and rights that are there because of the european union mm -hmm. yeah i would i would completely agree and i hope that this uh, this optim on this optimistic note probably uh, listeners will be very pleased to search for opportunities to know more about international and EU laws and and uh, really I think this was a very valuable uh, input I hope so and I absolutely I encourage you all to uh, you know to be active to be proactive like um, um, I don't exactly rem remember what Steve Jobs said stay hungry stay yeah. you know yeah. I would say stay active stay European yeah. and uh, you know uh, engage with with all these with these issues uh, with, we, which are challenging of course but are really really interesting and hey there is a great potential in the European Union so let's, let's go and grab it yeah. Professor Gatta thank you for coming here thank you very, thank you, very, very thank much. you very much for having yeah. me